So we should be able to sum, uh, end the summary of uh, this book with this podcast. We are still in the summary of prioritization, monitoring, implementation. And here we are looking at an example of how prioritization can change based on uh, what metrics you use f to measure risk. So using different metrics to measure risk can lead to different priorities for action. As we said, in uh, the IPCC AR6, the framework used in AR5 was uh, risk as a multiplication of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. In AR6, it's hazard, vulnerability, exposure, and response. So there, uh, hazard is of course climate extremes, sea level rise, so chronic and uh, acute risks ac emerge out of that. And then you have uh, vulnerability which depends on various factors like you, the housing you are living in, per capita income, education level, etc. Exposure depends on uh, infrastructure, population density, etc. And response now of course can reduce your risk because uh, how quickly the disaster management system responds uh, in case of a, a hurricane or a flood or a cyclone, uh, etc., uh, determines the overall risk as well. So here it's slightly different. So using different metrics to measure risk can lead to different priorities for action. Annual asset risk. So we'll, uh, you have to look up how it was done by the paper that's cited here. So this is a multi-hazard risk uh, so national total PHP 72 billion so you can look up where the hotspots are in terms of the risk metric here but if you l use instead number of people falling into poverty each year then you can see that annual consumption poverty increase as percentage of regional population national total of point percent uh, is 0.5 percent of the population so it's a kind of a metric so uh, let's not worry too much about the details of the metric but you can clearly see how the hotspots there is this based on annual risk the risk goes up here in this scale the scales are different so you have to be careful but this one becomes lower in this uh, number of people falling into poverty. This one which has low risk in this metric becomes high risk here and then so on and the differences here as well. Further if you look at annual well-being risk, so well-being losses, uh, national total PHP 167 billion, so again different regions light up and if you use socioeconomic resilience then these regions light up which haven't lit up in these metrics at all. Right, so these go down. Resilience is, of course, how quickly and uh, you recover from a shock or a perturbation. So these risks obviously indicate different things: that the infrastructure recovery, transportation network of trains, public transportation, etc., may be differently uh, vulnerable here than here, uh, but they are differently vulnerable to these metrics here. So it gets complicated. Anyway, action item 8.3, set concrete sector level targets to guide implementation by line ministries. So, you know, agriculture, forestry, water, infrastructure, environment, etc. Transport, energy, water, environment, social protection and other ministries will implement and fund most adaptation and risk reduction interventions and Local authorities will also impor uh, be important players. To allocate responsibilities, an adaptation and resilience strategy can set sector-level targets for 2025 or 2030, leaving detailed policy implementations for achieving the targets to the relevant ministries. I love this time horizon because all the projections beyond 2050, I think, are pointless, they are uncertain, and it's very hard to make any decisions, but these are the timescales at which actual investment can be made, progress uh, can be monitored, etc. And if we are not on target to net zero and decarbonization by 2040, 2050, then we should worry about just that instead of worrying about what will happen in 2080 or 2100. That's my opinion. 
The main text of this guide provides a list of potential indicators that can be used to set these goals. Having a res representative body such as Parliament approve a list of targets could significantly improve ownership and accountability and strengthen the strategy's authority. It could also help institutionalize a formal and regular reporting process, which we will si see in a minute. Uh, action 8.4, screen all public policies and expenditures for disaster and climate risks and align them with adaptation targets. So there are different pieces, uh, sectoral and uh, you know metric based etc. But they all have to add up to serving the adaptation targets. Adaptation measures can only be cost effective if all investments and planning decisions consider climate related risks in their design to mainstream adaptation measures in this way governments must systematically screen relevant policies and expenditures even those without an explicit adaptation or climate rationale to avoid any negative effects on adaptation objectives so we must stay focused on the objectives one priority is improving pro uh, public investment management PIM to include specific actions and controls that will ensure public investments are consistent with adaptation strategy objectives and consider disaster and climate risks the ultimate goal is mainstreaming climate change considerations in PIM private public investment management across all institutions and all projects multiple tools are readily available to help governments conduct such a screening process these include the world bank group's climate risk screening tools which help project development teams assess possible climate change or disaster risks to their project and identify interventions for reducing risks and increasing resilience obviously this book is from the world bank people uh, so they highlight what World Bank can do uh, or help, how it can help. But there is also a lot of cynicism, uh, skepticism about World Bank and whether it really helps or it hurts and so on. But we will leave that debate aside. Just focus on the principles that are provided, albeit by the World Bank itself. Action item 8.5, allocate appropriate funding to the adaptation strategy. Once an adaptation and resilience strategy has been prepared, it needs to be appropriately funded. A small dedicated adaptation budget may be needed, especially for monitoring and evaluating progress. This is always critical to make sure we are on the right path. However, most of the funding needs are for sectoral interventions, for example, more resilient roads, investment in irrigation, financial protection instruments, and so on. To fund such interventions, governments can create dedicated funds with the mandate of funding investments in resilience or climate change measures, which include adaptation and or mitigation. There is a lot of overlap between them. But it may be preferable to integrate adaptation and resilience funding into sectoral budgets rather than create dedicated budgets. For example, funding investments to increase resilience in the transport system through the transport infrastructure budget would ensure investments in the transport systems and in transport resilience uh, are consistent and synergistic. Sorry, I, the emphasis I did is a little bit off, so let me read it again. For example, funding investments to increase resilience in the transport system through the transport infrastructure budget would ensure investments in the transport system and in transport resilience are consistent and synergistic that's better budget tagging and expenditure reviews we will look at toolbox L in the main text can help track resources spent on adaptation and resilience even when they are integrated in general budget so they are part of the big budget but you can track progress on them and that they are meeting the goals uh, action item 8.6 track progress over time and review and revise strategy this is very critical adaptation strategy itself has to be adaptive to the changing risks and changing climate especially uh, okay and human behavior track progress over time and review and revise the strategy adaptation and resilience strategy can be further strengthened as new challenges 
and insights become apparent over time. Continuous tracking of progress indicators can highlight specific sectors in which implementation lags behind. If milestones are missed, implementation challenges such as capacity or resource constraints or coordination failures between implementing bodies may become apparent that were not accounted for in the initial strategy design. Flexibility in the adaptation strategy would allow course corrections and adjustments to be programmed as integral elements of the strategy rather than being regarded as admissions of failure. So one should expect the climate situation to evolve continuously, maybe to a better level by human activities on climate action, adaptation, mitigation, or maybe worse because there are unintended feedbacks and tipping points in the system, even though I'm not a big fan of this tipping point heuristic ideas as much as I am of um, just directly doing decadal predictions to see where we are on the decision horizon. Such strategy revisions are also likely to become necessary as new challenges and risks arise. For example, the COVID-19 pandemic forced governments to reevaluate their approach to emergency management. Did we learn any lessons? Is this going to change our long-term behavior? That has to be seen still. Scientific advances and technologies are also likely to become available, enabling actors to implement actions in more targeted, cost-effective ways. The big deal here is that the corporations, businesses, banking systems, everybody is paying attention. Even though everybody is not being as honest as we have discussed elsewhere, Volkswagen cheating on the emissions, uh, there are, you know, Toyota opposing environmental regulations on uh, or subsidies or incentives for electric uh, battery vehicles because it invested in hydrogen fuel cell. So profit motives begin to create various situations. And of course, there are technological promises on which we are relying for estimating future risks like carbon capture and sequestration, which are not scalable yet. So a lot of the progress and l where climate goes and what impacts we will see will depend on uh, how well we do on the technological promises that we are relying on for the future. So adaptation and mitigation there are very closely tied together. So this is the end of the summary uh, of the book. So these uh, seven or eight podcasts may serve you well enough to get an idea of the summary of adaptation principles, but there are many more nice details, especially toolboxes and short-term action plans and so on, which we will learn uh, in the podcasts that follow. Okay, see you in the next podcast.